Dear friends, dear colleagues, I welcome you to the conference on plus development here in Kassel, which is simultaneously also the second conference of the Alternatives to Development Network. I'm very happy and grateful that so many of you made it to this place, sometimes even quite far away, so from South Africa, from Colombia, from Ecuador, from Saudi Arabia, Australia, the Netherlands, Austria, the UK, Serbia and Kurdistan. A very special welcome also to someone who probably arrived from Berlin or from Rome, depending on the weather. We are very pleased to have at our, as our guest today Wolfgang Sachs. As the editor of the Development Dictionary in 1992, he was one of the instigators of an intellectual revolution in development theory and policy called post-development. The potentials and limits, the results and the legacies of which we are hopefully going to discuss today and tomorrow. This revolution shook the grounds of the discipline by questioning that some societies are developed and other societies are underdeveloped, and that the latter have to be developed in the image of and on the basis of expertise of the former. Denouncing this type of thinking as Eurocentric and colonial, the post-development school declared it to be obsolete, pointing to alternatives to development at the margins, where the excluded would reclaim their economy, politics and their knowledge in what, it, in what they called the new commons. Now, since then, a lot has been written and many battles have been fought. But when I was opening the newspaper last week, I was reminded of the fact that some things do not seem to have changed fundamentally. I remember 20 years ago, in the last century, when I was studying, I was collecting signatures and organizing protests against the Sarla Sarva Dam on the Narmada River in Gujarat, in India. That dam, that dam provided prime example for the destructive power of projects of development, uprooting and displacing approximately 300,000 people, the majority of which were Adivasi. Now, two decades later, they are still building the dam higher and higher, and again, 178 villages are to be flooded. But just like them, the Namada Bachao and Dolan and Meda Patkar, are organizing protests and going on hunger strike. So the battle goes on. But not, not, not only in the Namada Valley. According to estimates by social scientists, every year 10 to 15 million people are losing their livelihoods, are being displaced by projects of development or consequences thereof. Still, some battles for alternatives, for accountability, for autonomy, for dignity or for life in general, has been successful. We can think of the Zapatistas in Mexico. We can also think of Guadalajara in Bolivia and Ecuador, which has been anchored in the Constitution, where the rights of nature have been anchored in the Constitution. We can also think of the Kurdish struggle in Rojava, two participants of which I am also honored to welcome here. In terms of intellectual struggles, Ashish Kotari, Alberto Acosta, and Ariel Saleh have been or will be presenting post development dictionary tonight, which gives an overview over many concepts which have come to be a guiding principle for social movements struggling not for the universal idea of development but for a host of local alternatives. Their book is entitled Pluriverse. To make absolutely clear, that they have dispensed with the dangerous notion of knowing how the world should be shaped. So this, the pluriverse, means they are committed to autonomy and to diversity. However, these alternatives should be non-hierarchical, anti-patriarchal, sustainable, etc., etc. So there is a certain tension here, which we can discuss later, certainly. All in all, post development call for fundamental alternatives is confronted today with a political context of <coughs> rising authoritarianism. 
democratic politicians everywhere are looking for ways to stem the rise of right-wing parties. You can see them everywhere, from Trump to Bolsonaro, from Modi in India to the rise of the IFD in Germany. Post-development answer, communities based on solidarity and dignity, on local economies and on a more humble relation to nature, but also to other human beings, might be an alternative worthwhile thinking about. Or, as Arturo Escobar would say, worthwhile thinking, feeling about. Overcoming the idea that rationality and emotions have to be clearly separated from one another. And it is this thinking, feeling about my welcome address here that leads me to one last point I would like to make. German poet Bertolt Brecht once wrote a poem entitled Questions of a Reading Worker, in which he would puzzle about what he read in the history books. Because the history books claimed that Alexander the Great conquered India, or that Caesar defeated the Gauls. To which Bertolt Brecht put the question, well, were they alone in doing that? Or did they not even have a crook with them, or whatever? So, making a point, um, which leads me to correct my initial remark. Of course, it is not I who welcome you here, it is us. And the us, well, the us is the whole organizing team responsible for this conference. So, I'm, I would like to take the opportunity to briefly introduce to you and to say thank you to the bunch of wonderful people with whom I had the pleasure of sharing the work of organizing this conference in the last two months, or actually the last eight months, probably. So, um, therefore, let me briefly like to um, present and thank Annalena Hommel. She's probably sitting outside, right? So, we'll have to take <laughs> Normally we do this at the end of the conference, but I thought at the end some people might have been leaving already. And I think it is really important that you know whom to thank for this conference.
this already brings me to our keynote, to Ashish Kothari himself, who will be um, giving a talk on radical ecological democracy. Julia, could you change the slide? Yeah, Ashish is an Indian environmentalist working on the issues of development and post-development. He's one of the founders of Kalpa Rich, the Environmental Action Group, and he's also been associated with numerous other groups and committees. For example, the Amana Bachao Andola, the Beach Bachao Andola. He has been teaching um, at the Indian Institute for Public Administration for 12 years, and he's also been a member of the steering committee of the World Commission on Protected Areas. Uh, until recently, he was the chairman of Greenpeace's India board. And what makes him also very interesting is that he's coordinating the VCAL Sangam process, the alternative conferences, on which we will learn a little bit in the presentation. Um, I had the pleasure of seeing the presentation already yesterday <laughs> when he was giving a talk in Aachen. Now, um, Ashish Kotari is, um, has a master's in um, sociology from the University of Delhi and has published a number of books. So I'm not going to be able to read all of them, two of them. So special mention, the one is called Churning the Earth, the Making of Global India. And the other one is relatively recent and is entitled Alternative Futures, India Unshackled. And um, what is not in his vita and what is not in what is not in the Wikipedia page is that Ashish Kotari is an extremely sympathetic, kind, reflective type of person. And this was not the reason for inviting him, but makes it all the happier. So thanks, Ashish, for being here, and we're looking forward to your keynote. Corporation, 
violence on people, with millions of people being displaced, dispossessed of their resources, <coughs> from their homes, and uh, uh, violence against cultures, uh, this whole notion that basically it's only modern, rational societies that are worth living, and everything that's traditional and emotional and so on is like, has to be left behind. So it is multiple forms of violence that one can see in the name of, of development. And it's interesting that, for instance, if you go to a doctor and the doctor says you have growth, there's panic, right, because it means cancer. But you go to an economist and they, and you know, for them, growth is like worth celebrating. It's virtually every country in the world has this notion that we have to keep doing economic growth, regardless of the consequences which are so obvious now. Uh, it's also violence against uh, each one of us as an individual because we are seeing increasingly the kind of alienation that we are facing where we are alienated from the rest of nature, alienated from each other, but also alienated from ourselves. The ability to be able to look within ourselves, to feel happy with what we have, etc. is something that is destroyed in this process of development and, and, and modernity. And what I characterize that is a, a sort of a process from livelihoods where people were, were not doing jobs, they were actually having ways of living uh, which encompassed culture, it encompassed emotions, it encompassed uh, living, you know, how to deal with nature and so on, to deadlyhoods, which are where we're actually killing off uh, these sorts of livelihoods that live with and or coexist with nature. And we're creating jobs in the modern sector which are extremely dehumanizing. One of the biggest trends in India, for instance, if you go to an alternative course on living and so on, is 50 to 60 percent of the people there are IT professionals who, after 10, 20 years of sitting and doing this, are completely sick and tired of it and actually want to go back and do farming or handicrafts or whatever it is. So it's this, it is these multiple forms of violence that we see in the name. Uh, and we're also seeing that linked to this, this, this uh, global project um, is uh, the attack on democracy itself, the attack on basic fundamental values of what people, um, people want to feel mean meaningful, they want to feel involved, they want to participate. And you see that more and more this kind of, these kind of spaces which were hard fought for the last few decades are shrinking across the world, the growing authoritarianism, the growing uh, power of right-wing uh, parties and so on. So it's it's a process that is uh, clearly uh, not. Uh, I mean, it's clearly something that's not sustainable. It's not just. It's not fair. It is something that we have to be able to react to. So the question arises: Do we have alternatives? Because uh, many decades back, Margaret Thatcher gave this famous dictum. <coughs> there is no alternative. And there has been this question, is that really the case? Is, this, is it necessary that we all have to go through this process of destructive development and at some point kind of say, okay, we've got enough money now, so let's protect the little bit of wildlife that we have left and try and clean up the pollution and so on. Or are there actually genuine alternatives? In order to answer that question, it's very important for us to look at alternatives to what? Because we are being fed superficial answers. We are being told in India, for instance, it doesn't matter, keep creating the waste, but let's do better recycling. Or we are being told, okay, it's all right that carbon emissions are taking place. Some other country will absorb those carbons. We'll pay them for protecting the Amazon forest. Uh, or we'll do carbon trading. Or we will create this enormous shield around the earth and save us from, uh, from global warming. So there's technological fixes, market fixes, all kinds of things like that which are coming to us, which uh, are, uh, uh, you know, which, which, which the system is trying to tell us uh, are the solutions, but to a lot of us they are actually false solutions or they are dangerous distractions from what we really need to do. And so we need to actually look at the fundamental uh, the roots of why we have this crisis. And the roots can go in a somewhat simplistic manner to looking at different forms of the concentration of power or the dominations of different forms. Keep clicking, please. Uh, and that whether it's in the form of uh, the concentration of power in the hands of corporations in, in capitalism or concentration in the hands of men or 
patriarchy and masculinity, or concentration in the hands of, uh, of the state uh, ruling over us, the nation state ruling over us, or different castes, or races, or ethnicities, and of course of human beings over the rest of nature. And it's really, uh, it's, it's the, the, the ability to be able to, and the, the processes of challenging these fundamental forms of domination are what to my mind could be called alternatives. Unless one moves towards that, we're living in very superficial solutions that the system is giving us. So I'm going to talk about these things. Uh, I'm going to talk about, I've already said this, so I think we need to question uh, a lot of the false solutions. In the book, Blueverse, we have 15 essays which critique, including, uh, critique these sorts of uh, mainstream solutions or false solutions, including sustainable development. Because now the whole world is saying, okay, sustainable development by 2030, which really is quite a dubious, uh, dubious way of looking at things. And so what I'm going to do is to look at a range of uh, examples from around the world where you really do have meaningful, radical, systemic alternatives. Obviously, we don't have the time for me to go into detail into any of these examples, and this is just a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of some examples that we have around the world, but it's nice to be able to get a glimpse of, of this. So let me move to some of these. The first thing I want to say with the alternatives is that resistance to the dominant systems is part of the alternative. Not only because it slows down the bulldozer of development, which is destroying all of us, but also because it is an is an opportunity to present different worldviews. So this image, for instance, is, uh, sorry, just go back. That image is from, uh, yeah, that image is from 30, 25, about 25 years back, a demonstration in central India against a big hydroelectricity project. Um, and what these people who made this human chain across the river were saying, they were telling the government, that when you, as engineers, or economists look at the river, you think of megawatts of power. For us, the river is our mother. It's two completely opposing civilizational views, or two completely opposite worldviews. And it's through these resistance struggles that we actually see, whether it's a resistance against patriarchy, or against development, or against uh, racism, or whatever, that you can actually see, in some sense, also multiple <laughs> visions uh, coming out. But at the same time, we also need to find uh, what would be called more constructive or uh, reconstructive or constructive ways of meeting the needs and aspirations of people because it does so happen that a vast majority of people because of historical circumstances do face deprivations, whether it's deprivation from food or water or housing or sanitation or education or health or whatever. So we need to find also constructive ways of creating these. Can you just keep clicking? I wish I could operate that. But just, just keep thinking. So, uh, yeah, uh, just, just go on. Basically, we've been documenting uh, across India hundreds of examples of this kind where people are actually trying to meet their basic needs and aspirations through means that are ecologically sustainable and which are also equitable and just and fair. Uh, we have a website which I'll show you later which already has 1,500 stories of this kind. But this is something that's happening across the world. It's not just in India. Keep going. So I hope I get a few minutes extra because of this. <laughs> yeah, just keep going. So uh, around the world, there's examples, and that's why we did this. Uh, uh, we did this uh, uh, book because uh, Alberto, I Alberto just walked in. Uh, Alberto and I and another colleague called Federico met in 2014 uh, in the Degrowth Conference in 2016. Sorry, in Leipzig. 14 in Leipzig. And uh, we were talking about, he was talking about UN Vivir and so on, I was talking about Swaraj, Federico was talking about degrowth, and others were talking about other things. And we were saying, well, we don't actually have a place where we can see or, uh, or, or understand all these different examples. So that's why the book came about. Sorry, keep clicking. Um, we could spend days looking at these examples. But obviously we don't have the time. So this is just to be able to give you a glimpse of that. And also to put up this map, which I think is a wonderful decolonial map. Ah, fantastic. Thank you. Oh, maybe if I use this. Alright. Alright, I, I love showing this map, especially in India, because everybody 
everybody who sees this map says, why is it upside down? Uh, and I have to explain that the map we are normally used to is a colonial map where Europe was on top and England was, and Europe was actually shown to be much bigger than it actually is because that was the, uh, those were the colonial countries. This, this, is the, this is the actual size of the continents and maybe the right way of looking at it. But also just to be able to point out that there are examples around the world. All right, so let me give you a few of these. Uh, a few of them are from India, a few from elsewhere. This is uh, an example from southern India of Dalit women farmers. Now those of you who know the Indian caste system will realize that, uh, will know that Dalits are the most oppressed, so-called untouchables or outcasts of Indian Hindu society. As women, they are uh, oppressed in patriarchal systems and they are also very small farmers. So even in class terms, they are marginalized. Over the last uh, maybe something like 30 years, these these women have brought back into cultivation about 70 or 80 varieties of local seeds, millets, rice and so on. They have completely shifted to organic. They do a lot of collective uh, operations, seed exchange, credit uh, exchange, uh, sharing knowledge and things like that. And through asserting a, a feminine way of looking at, at the land uh, and at seeds and at agriculture, they've actually created uh, not just food security in, situ in a situation where there, there was there used to be hunger and starvation in their families to now where they have surplus food in their homes but also food sovereignty and this is very very important because they're saying it's not just about having enough to eat but it's about having the control over what we eat and how we produce what we eat that is so important and i will be coming back to this as a principle uh, later uh, another example is uh, from also from is from Central India, where there has been this movement to try and gain some level of self self determination and control over one's life, and not be content with the fact that we go to elections once in five years and we vote the party in power and we hope the hell that that party will do the right thing for us, which it often doesn't. But to say that no, in our place where we are, we will be the decision. So this is a federation of 90 villages that has fought against mining and has now been asserting its, uh, its right to self-determine. But interestingly also realizing that it's not just about asserting a traditional way of life. Because in traditional way of life there were fantastic things, but there were also problems like women were never part of the decision making process. So you did have some levels of masculinity and patriarchy, which needs to be dealt with. So, uh, enabling uh, the environment uh, to also take place. This itself is an uh, example that has been inspired by one single village that has kind of created a thinking revolution in many parts of India, which is this village which 30 years back declared that even as we elect the government in Delhi and Mumbai, in our village, we are the government. And nobody else is going to come and tell us what we should be doing. We will do it, and we will do it as consensus with all the people in the village. And three or four years back, they also uh, converted all their private agricultural land into the village commons. So not a square inch of private property in that village anymore. Because they were also saying this transformation also needs to challenge the whole notion of private property. Which I guess in a country like Germany is very, a very interesting thing to say. Or, or all across the West. Um, I was recently uh, in, in Ecuador, in the Ecuadorian Amazon. Uh, with a indigenous nation called the Sapara. And the Sapara have claimed their territorial uh, rights uh, across their entire area and traditional area, but also now and, and are, are trying to struggle against oil exploration and mining, which the government wants to bring in there. Uh, but also then asserting, firstly, their own traditional ways of life, but also looking at alternative new ways of uh, livelihood, such as, for instance, very sensitive community led health based ecotourism and other things like local products so that they can actually show that even with the kind of changes taking place in contemporary society and especially the aspirations of young people even in their own community, you can be thinking of alternative ways of economic livelihood and not have to go the way of mining and extractivism and oil and, and so on. Um, you get uh, a number of examples, many of you I'm sure are familiar with, are probably part of the kind of social solidarity or non-profit uh, economy initiatives in different parts of Europe, uh, alternative currencies, time banking, non-profit cafes, so many of them.
sure probably even in this town there are examples, including I think the food that we're going to eat is uh, of this kind. So even challenging the dominant economic system, the dominant monetary system through these kinds of alternatives. Um, including things like worker-led factories, where workers, this is a factory in uh, Greece, where uh, the workers took over the entire factory and said, we will operate this completely democratically. Everybody will get the same wage for an hour of work, regardless of what work you're doing in the factory. And there's this big slogan on the factory wall which says, we need no boss. So a non-hierarchical system of trying to do industrial production. And also switching from chemical detergents to Olive oil, olive, olive oil based eco friendly clean products. Uh, or the movements towards rights to determine what should happen in a city. Um, why should the bureaucrats in the city or the politicians in the city be the ones to decide planning and budgeting and things like that? Why should it not be all the citizens of that city? And so the move towards uh, municipalism, towards uh, asserting that in our colony we will be the ones who will be doing the budgeting and the planning. And then we try and figure out how this links to the neighboring colony and then across the whole city. That we need to be set to be a part of this decision making process. This is an example from Western in, uh, India, uh, a town where in fact this kind of assertion is happening. And where they, it's not just about decision making but also saying that okay, can we also be somewhat sustainable in our resource uses? This is one of India's lowest rainfall area. And they're trying to sh show how they don't need a big dam somewhere 300 kilometers away, displacing 300,000 people to bring the water to our region. We can be doing our own responsible water harvesting and make sure that the use of water is, in, is, uh, is uh, limited so that we are not over extending the water resources. Um, there's so many examples, one can go on and on and on, uh, of, of uh, communities trying to actually assert this kind of economic and political uh, and cultural identity, autonomy and independence in many different ways. Uh, already Aram has mentioned the Kurdish Udawa and the Zapatista. Besime is here uh, from the Kurdish women's movement and she will tell us uh, maybe today or tomorrow about that. Uh, it's such an inspiring way of looking at it. If you, in the middle of an intense war zone, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Turkey, you can actually have thousands of people trying to practice radical, direct democracy based on eco-feminist principles. I mean, what more, what more inspiring uh, example does one need? Uh, and what more proof does one need that you can actually practice this? And it's not just about these tiny little villages doing something different. You actually do it or even on a larger scale. <laughs> we'll hear much more from her later today. Um, hundreds of thousands of examples of communities uh, like the Sapara territory saying, okay, this is this has been our traditional territory, we will claim our rights to it and we will move towards self-determination and we will also protect nature. It's really important that this combination is being considered. It's not just about saying this is our territory, keep off. We do what we want. That's the way that they're looking at it. Uh, it's about saying that yes, we will also protect nature and also that it will be open localization, which is to say that we are not close to, for instance, if, you, if refugees need to come in because they have nowhere else to go, we will also welcome them. There's some amazing examples of that also taking place. It's not a xenophobic kind of localization that one is talking about. Alternative learning spaces, because education has been so so disempowering for children and for all of us, at least in most parts of the world. Uh, it has been uh, something where you basically create uh, little boxes to fit into the system. Right? Each one of us becomes a little box that fits in somewhere in the, into the government or corporate system. And here's a whole bunch of alternative learning spaces where children, young people are actually learning how to be a responsible human being, but how to be a questioning human being, how to think for oneself, how to how one's creativity can come out in much better ways, uh, and so on. Uh, there's many, many in India that I know of, but uh, of course there's also around the world. Uh, and to go back to words, the origins of words are very, very important. School comes from the original word skole in Greek, which meant leisure. Now, how many of us have actually been to a school where we actually had leisure? <laughs> I have. Anybody else? Okay, great, you're lucky. Uh, 
uh, but most people, most kids in the world do not have that. Schools are like prisons. Um, democracy. The origin of the word is power of the people. Not power of politicians we elect. But we have, for some reason, thought that the democracy is about elections. So anyway, uh, that's just my pet project of going back to the origins of words. I think it's very important. Now, based on these examples and many, many more, uh, can we find some kind of frameworks or, or visions of what an alternative society could look like? And I'm going to talk over the next few minutes uh, about one that emerges from the examples that I know of or have been involved with in India, which we would call eco Swaraj or radical ecological democracy. The word Swaraj, I think I was already mentioning, is a worldview which talks about my autonomy and my freedom or my community's autonomy and freedom in responsibility to your autonomy and freedom. So it's not the American way of looking at freedom where I can run my SUV vehicle wherever I want. It's saying, yes, I should have my identity and I should do, be able to do what I want, but it should not be at the expense of somebody else and their ability to also be free and autonomous and self-determined. So it's really, uh, uh, Swaraj in that sense is a very deep notion of, of maybe some form of democracy which is really genuine. And here, uh, this notion of radical ecological democracy is basically, it's a very simple notion. Wherever we are, in whatever context we are, we are part of decision making. The power lies with us. But because the power lies with us, it should be power with others, not over others. It should be responsible for everybody's well-being and everybody including other species. So therefore, radical, that is to the roots, ecological democracy. But that's just one idea uh, in, uh, in, in, in a whole pluriverse of ideas that are around the world. That's what's coming out from parts of India, but then we have, of course, uh, so many from Latin America, which Alberto and others will tell us about. We have so many coming out from, uh, from Africa, and we have African colleagues who will probably tell us about these. We have so many coming out even from in the middle of the most intense industrialization in Japan called Kyosai, which I'd never heard of before book together, which is kind of similar to, to Buenu Vir and Swaraj and so on. Or we have others like Sente Pensar and Mino, I can't even pronounce that, Mino, but Sibin from Native American, North, North American Natives populations. And then also those coming out of the, the modern context or the contemporary context in Europe and in the US and so on, like eco or eco-feminism or eco-socialism and many, many others. Ariel is here who will speak about uh, eco-feminism. So, the point is that we do have this richness, this pluriverse of, of both practices and concepts that are re-emerging from the past or emerging anew from current context. And we need to be able to understand, celebrate and link them up. Um, if you look at it, in most of or all of these examples, you can think of transformations taking place in five aspects of life. If you think of the central Indian villages saying, we are the government in our village, they're talking about direct democracy. So there's the whole transformation taking place in the political sphere of radical, direct, delegated, uh, and eco-regional democracy, which also then means that we need to start questioning the nation state boundaries that we have right now, which in most cases are historical accidents. In many cases are colonial constructs, like the whole of Africa was divided up into neat straight lines by folks sitting somewhere in Europe. Uh, <clears throat> questioning that on the basis of what is ecologically relevant and what is culturally re relevant. Because for instance, in South Asia, our nation state boundaries cut up mangrove systems, cut up mountain systems, cut up desert systems, and the peoples who live in those are all being divided uh, by political forces which they had no control or no involvement in. So we need to rethink uh, politics in many fundamental ways. But the same with economic democracy. When the women of southern India are asserting food sovereignty, or when the Safara business people are saying that in our territory we should be able to determine the, the economy we want, uh, they're talking about economic democracy. 
They're also increasingly people are talking about instead of economic globalization, economic localization can be meet our at least our basic needs in our own uh, regions, which doesn't mean every single small unit, but like in our some kind of smaller geographic region. Economic localization and political localization can, however, be dangerous if they are not also accompanied by social justice and struggles for equality. Because they could lead to local elites capturing power and a situation for, say, women or the oppressed castes in India or wherever becoming much worse. So the third important sphere is social justice and notions of well-being. What is the notion of happiness? Is it about going shopping or is it about being able to interact like this and have friends, uh, not only on Facebook but face-to-face -face, uh, kind of thing. So that, that's the third sphere. The fourth sphere is culture and knowledge diversity. And this is so, so, so very important in a world where we are being told that there's only one form of knowledge that's legitimate, supposedly modern science and technology, or that there's only one cultural way of doing things. And to say that that's not the case, if there are thousands of languages on the planet, every one of those language, languages is important. If there's hundreds of ways of, cultural ways of relating to nature, they're all important. And we need to figure out how coexistence can take place amongst them. And then the fifth sphere, which of course may be even thought of as sort of underlying all of this, is of course ecological resilience and, and sustainability and wisdom, because without sustaining the earth, we're not dead anyway. Now, um, and the last couple of things I want to say, in fact, the next slide, to my mind, is my most important slide. If I was to give a presentation with this one slide, it would be this next one. Which is that at the core of this transformation, at the core of the incredibly diverse examples we find around the world for radical alternatives, is a set of values. Um, not all of these values are going to be thought of or defined or expressed in exactly the same way across the world. There'll be very diverse ways of doing it. But there are some common threads that possibly that we can see. So when we put these 90 essays together, Alberto, Ariel, myself, and a couple of other colleagues, we were saying, well, what is that? What is the common thing between, say, Senthi Petsar somewhere, and Goen Vivir somewhere, and Swarat somewhere, else, and Kyosai somewhere, else, et cetera, or the different practices of agroecology and transition towns and uh, Feminism and so on. What, you know, what, what's, what's, what? How do we relate all of these? Or do we simply say they're all completely isolated and on, and on their own? And we thought that perhaps one way of doing it is to say, okay, there are these common ethics that are emerging from all of them, either explicitly or implicitly. The ethic of collectives, for instance, rather than individual selfishness. The, the ethic of sharing and caring, rather than uh, anonymous monetary exchanges in, in the economy. Um, the ethic of Simplicity, not easy to define and certainly not easy to live, but saying, okay, can we think about enoughness rather than more and more and more and more, and so on. So this is just one set of such principles and ethics. And I think, Aram, you're pointing to the fact that can you actually have universal values in a pluriverse? Is that a contradiction? I don't know. It's worth discussing over the next two days. Uh, perhaps we think of these as some common threads, but which are expressed in extremely diverse ways. Uh, and so therefore, yes, maybe there are some universal common threads. It's certainly worth discussing. But that's what we think emerges from, from these, and it's really at the core of things. So it's not really saying, let's take the example of the Deccan Development Society, Dalit women, and apply it somewhere else, but say, what are the principles of learning from it? What are the lessons, the ethics? And then in our own cultural and ecological context, let's see what we can do with the same sort of values. Um, so, let me leave you with uh, a few questions that are, that are, uh, that all of us need to struggle with. There are no easy answers to this. Who will be at the forefront of leading this transformation? Is it academics, like many of us sitting in this room? Is it activists in cities? Is it workers' unions? Is it farmers' groups? Is it children in, in Fridays for Future? Is it those folks who are sitting and disrupting systems in Extinction Rebellion? Is it a combination of all of these? Is it politicians? Who is actually going to be leading this? How do we make all these different wonderful examples meet with each other and create the macro change, the macroeconomic political change that we need? 
Is there a need for a state? Um, or can we think of a future where people are self-governing and linking up with each other across the landscapes and there's no need for a centralized state? Will there be a need for, what would be a global governance system? The United Nations has failed us uh, because it's so nation state based. Is there a United Peoples of the world? Is there some sort of people's assembly? How do you make sure it doesn't become another concentration of power? Um, will there still be a private business sector? Uh, or will business all be controlled by socially through workers themselves? Uh, and then, especially in this context, in the university, how do we rethink our own disciplines and epistemologies and ways of teaching and learning and thinking and doing research and so on and so forth? Can we, for instance, say that universities <coughs> don't have to be only single individuals, but you can have the mind PhDs of 20 people, those who we work with in the village and us combined, you have 20 people having a PhD. Is that possible? I don't know. There's so many things that have to be rethought uh, and decolonized in our own, uh, whichever sphere of work we are in. So, um, just a few quick thoughts on this. To my mind, uh, something that's really, really important is that we have to constantly be working both on the resistance and the alternatives, and I've tried to present some glimpses of both. That even as we fight fundamental transformation, we also need to be working towards transition, towards creating the spaces, even in the existing system, that can enable us to live more dignified lives, but also constantly. So even as we try and make the state accountable and transparent and responsive, we also try and struggle to see, okay, can, how can we move towards a stateless society? So it's this difficult, very difficult balancing and combination that, that we need to be working towards. And even as we do this struggle in our daily life, and constantly we're sort of, all of us are working 30 hours a day, can we find the time to sit back and reflect on what is our dream for the future? What's our vision of the future? And then get back out to earth and say, okay, well, how do we try and move towards that? So thinking utopia uh, becomes a very important part of this. Uh, um, so let me, I'm oh, sorry, I missed that. Uh, one of the most important aspects here is how do we build the critical alliances between the global north and the global south? And by global north, global south, you're all familiar with the term. I'm also indicating, therefore, between me sitting in a city, highly privileged class, working with a village okay, uh, in India, but also then Germany working with India or whatever, however you want to look at that. And I think it's really important that these alliances are there because these are the ones that will help us to cross-learn, to, to teach each other, to support each other, to especially support each other when we are threatened wherever we are. But they can only work, they should only work if they are working in a decolonial way. It's not about the North coming and helping the South. As Ivan Ilyich a few years back, uh, many years back actually said very, very clearly in an address to an American university where the students were going to go to Latin America to help the local people move out of poverty. He said, if you're going for that, please stay in the US. Do not go because it's patronizing. But if you're coming to understand our situation and to express solidarity and to change your own ways of thinking and living, then yes, you're welcome. So how do we find these ways, not patronizing the colonial ways of being, of creating these alliances? Um, and so finally, uh, a couple of processes that we're involved with in trying to build the bridges and trying to create the alliances and trying to have this kind of cross-learning taking place. Aram has mentioned this is a process we initiated about five years back called the Vikalp Sangam. Uh, alternatives confluence, not a conference, but a confluence, a gathering, a sacred gathering, let's say, of, of ideas and practices and, and visions and so on. And through that learning and through that also doing collective visioning. We've done about 15 of these spaces around the, around the country on a thematic and regional basis. And uh, also then created a website where a lot of the examples from around India can be, uh, can be put. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the website. Um, and then thinking that, okay, well, we need to do the same thing across the world. Because there's similar things happening in so many parts of the world. How do we create a platform of exchange and sharing and collective visioning also across the world. So just a few months back, we've launched the Global Tapestry of Alternatives. 
the idea of a tapestry is that it's woven wherever people are. It, there's no centralizing process of making that cloth. So if you're if you've got a network of alternative initiatives in Germany, you're weaving your own. And, but then how do you and what we're doing in India link up so that it becomes a more a bigger and bigger tapestry of alternatives and, and greater critical mass. Um, so. Uh, Couple of books. On uh, the left is a book that we did where we asked 40 uh, people who are activists or researchers or academics or whatever to sit back and dream the India, the ideal India for 2100. Um, very difficult exercise. We had to keep asking them because most people came back with their first draft, which was, okay, we recommend that uh, you know that that women should be paid the same thing as men. We recommend that blah blah blah. It was like a seminar report, and we said no, no, that's not. We want you to say, in 2100, what is the ideal relationship between men, women, and other sexualities that you would like to see? Then come back down to earth and okay, show us what are the possible pathways, what are the challenges, what are the different So that's the book on the left, 40 essays on different subjects, and then on the right is a book that's already been introduced and will be further introduced this evening. Last slide. People often see this presentation and say, oh, okay, that's all nice, but it's too utopian. It's nice and idealistic, but it's never going to happen. And so therefore, this is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, it's often cited to be Galliano, uh, the wonderful Latin American poet Galliano. It's not Galliano, he's actually citing a Argentinian uh, filmmaker. Where it says, Utopia is on the horizon. I move two steps closer. It moves two steps further away. I walk another 10 steps, and Utopia runs another 10 steps away. So as much as I may walk, I never reach it. So what's the point of utopia? The point is this, it makes us continuously advance in a direction that we want to make. So uh, please, let's never disregard utopian thinking. And even as we do that, we have our feet firmly on the ground and we're trying to practice these radical alternatives. Thank you very much.
So whatever I say is going to be extremely simplistic. And I'm sorry about that. But there is lack of time. And also lack of, uh, I, I, you know, for me also, it's a lot of struggle trying to even address these questions that have been partial answers. What form of global governance? Uh, I think <coughs> in an ideal sense, if one is to move beyond nation states and start thinking about peoples of the world, self-defined in some way, um, what we could be seeing is that building up from those units of direct democracy where people are doing face-to-face -face decision making, some of the examples that I gave, you could be building what Gandhi called oceanic circles of governance and connection. So over a landscape of a river basin, for instance, you grow that and then one river basin and another river basin, etc. Now if you think of it like that, you could actually keep expanding those oceanic circles to the whole globe. Where most of the problems that we are creating would hopefully be solved at those much smaller units. Uh, let's say the second circle or the third circle or whatever, uh, which would be a couple of river bases together or a couple of smaller or now our countries but together. And uh, by the time you reach that global circle, there actually aren't too many serious issues left to deal with. Because if you look at it, climate change is a huge global problem, but it's created locally, right? So if you were to like, have movements which completely stop fossil fuels all over the world and move towards decentralized renewable energy and, of course, much, much lesser use of energy, especially in the global north, then would you still need a global meeting at some point to try and solve it? Probably not, but you need it for something. You still want global cultural exchanges. You might still want, because I don't know, Europe might still want some of its coffee coming from Africa. Uh, but so, so there'll be some things, of course, where global exchanges will take place. But it seems to me that some sort of people's assemblies of some kind will probably emerge out of that, where again, it's not representative democracy in the current sense, where these representatives then gain power. But it's more like a delegated thing where it's a very clear mandate coming from the, you know, the units of direct democracy and then they come back to the board to it, etc., which we have examples of, including, for instance, from ancient Greece, though women and slaves were excluded from that. But there were some notions of that kind. So I would say that a people's assembly of some kind would be what, uh, but what its nature and structure and all would be, I, I don't know. Somebody here has better ideas, please. There's a nice paper by uh, Richard Falk, on this, if you can look at that, and then there are a few other examples of that. But definitely, what we do not want is a global government, government which some people are talking about. That nation states are horrible, they don't do anything on climate change, let's have a global dictatorship, or some central government which tells everybody what to do. Um, private business. I think private capitalist business has no role in this. Business as well. And so it would be producers' unions, workers' cooperatives, uh, farmers' cooperatives, consumers' cooperatives, etc., which would be then doing all the production and all the exchange that is necessary. And we are already seeing in many examples around the world that this can actually happen at larger and larger scales in relatively democratic ways without some capitalists actually controlling everything. So, business, yes but not private capital businesses, more social. And by social, I don't mean government control. By social, I mean those controlled by workers themselves, or workers and consumers, producers and consumers. Deborah, what's the name? Did I get the name right? Oh. Ah, sorry. Um, yeah, I think this is a huge problem. It's not just South Africa. It's in many, many parts of the world uh, where either the World Bank or the IMF or some imperial country or the other created a situation of such indebtedness that it's very difficult for, for us to get out of it. But this is where I think it's very important to for people to assert that we are not responsible for what our governments have done. Let me give you an example of the Sahara indigenous nation in Ecuador. Alberto knows more about it, I'm sure. They are being asked, they are being told, we have to do oil drilling in your in the Amazon, in your territory. Because that's the only way to pay off the, China, the debt to China that we have. 
Now these Sapa are saying, we didn't create this debt. We didn't allow the Chinese to come in and build the infrastructure and then you know we are indebted to them for it. So why should we suffer and pay for what you guys sitting in Quito have done? Uh, it's this assertion that we need to figure out how to make more real. It's the assertion that okay, we do have our agricultural lands, we have our forests, we have our local production systems or can we build and create those? Can we do that through solidarity across different peoples of Africa in your case, or Kenya, or whichever part of Africa you're from, and uh, assert the autonomy of people's economy and politics, and say, if you guys are indebted to the World Bank, you deal with it. We are not going to suffer as a consequence. But in fact, even beyond that, and say, but actually, we can show you models of economic resurgence which make you, which do not force you to take the loans or whatever it is you're taking from places like the World Bank. So both a practical current thing and a future vision of how an economy could be run. And I know this sounds easier than it, obviously easier than it is, but this is what some communities are actually doing in different parts of the world. Uh, we should not be made responsible for what our governments have done. I think this is very, very important to realize that we are not responsible for our nation states and what they have done. Even if we are patriotic, I do not believe that as an Indian, I am responsible for what the Indian nation state today is doing in Kashmir or what is doing vis a Pakistan or whatever. And the same in Pakistan. So I, I, it's this assertion that I think we need to be able to do much more through cross people's solidarity and strengthening each other. Okay, further questions? Okay, I see one, two, three, and then four or five, maybe in the next round. Sorry, I have forgot to mention, the other thing is that I think the argument for, uh, Ariel I think has been involved with that, the argument for, uh, not just for forgiving debt, that's not the word, right? there's something else, but the argument to say that actually debt from colonial times and in the last few decades is itself illegitimate. Uh, and that in fact, if anything, there's a reverse debt, because it's because of our nature and natural resources that you guys are even surviving. And so the whole thing of uh, reparation for ecological debt is a very powerful argument. It hasn't gone anywhere obviously because of the way powers are, but it's a very powerful ethical argument for uh, fighting against the so-called economic or the financial debt that is being imposed on us. And I think that needs to also be part of the narrative. Sorry, I Is there any 
Is it the third one? I thought it was the third one there. Maybe it was the third Thank you for the presentation. My name is John Anwar. Uh, I'm with the ICD. Uh, yeah, and my question, my first part of my question is to what my friend just asked the micro question. And I want to ask, since most of us here are within the academy, the role of academics as, as you rightly push for it. This, this is a space where academics want to, want to be seen as um, quotes in quotes, authority in their area. So the whole hegemony about publishing in high impact journals and so sometimes I sit back and I ask, where do you leave the alternative? Because some, some people in the global south and in other spaces are trying to have an alternative to this hegemony when it comes to knowledge production. But in, in the next uh, break or in the other way around, you, you realize that, well, if you don't take care, you'll be invisible. Because if you, if you are to be invited as a keynote speaker to look at the publications, why are you publishing? Are you publishing, quote, quote, high impact journals, which all these things are, you know, part of the money structure. My next comment has to do with the collaboration. I will humbly suggest if we could also look more to South-South collaboration rather than always looking at the North-South collaboration. And, and then finally, also, to keep, let me end here to give time to other people. So what was the final comment? No, no, I want to end here. I want to oh, add okay. another but to give opportunity to other people. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so, uh, I'm sorry, you are, are Peace worker friend, I didn't get the name, but uh, uh, at the micro level, the question of yeah, how do we deal with the micro level? Yes, I think um, I mean as important as community, collective, uh, uh, societal transformation is the individual transformation. So if, you, if by micro you are saying me, I as an individual. Um, it, it has to go simultaneously. Um, and so the whole aspect of cultural, spiritual transformation, the word spiritual itself is something that sometimes gets misunderstood. So I'm not talking about orthodox religion, I'm just saying spiritual in terms of how we look at life, for instance, and respecting life, let us say. Um, how much do we have the chance and ability to actually look within ourselves, understand ourselves, respect ourselves and through that we respect others. The chance to grow ourselves uh, emotionally, spiritually, uh, intellectually, etc. and then therefore also be able to relate to others in that way. So that micro transformation is absolutely as important. My only problem is sometimes you get either this thing saying that let's first transform ourselves and then society will get transformed and then there's others maybe more on the leftist front, let's say, no society transformation, and in that process, individuals will also get transformed. And I don't think it's like a chicken and egg kind of thing. I mean, it is, in fact, a chicken and egg. I think both needs to happen together. So I totally agree with you, absolutely important. But let's see how we can do it uh, in uh, simultaneous to collective transformation. And in fact, I have found for myself that when there is a collective atmosphere around me, for instance, in my organization, that is questioning and enabling me to look within myself, that personal transformation becomes easier than if I was on my own. And so it is, I think, that very important two-way uh, process. Uh, the role of your hand, right? The name? John. John, sorry. Uh, the role of academics, did I miss out something? I the role of academics, yes. I think, uh, well, first of all, how does one do any of this without uh, falling into the traps of being having to be visible and things like that? So now we have to ask Aram why I was invited to the keynote address. But I am absolutely sure it wasn't because I have peer-reviewed journal articles, because I have very few, almost none actually. I don't even have a document. 
So I don't know whether he was this mad guy who invited me or whatever reason. <laughs> uh, but I think we need to break through those stereotypes of of having to do what the system is telling us, five peer reviewed articles every year, blah 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 blah, in order to become recognized and visible. And actually just do our own thing, um, which is to say, okay, I will be an academic and I will be teaching. Of course I might struggle and I will become a professor, but that's okay, I continue teaching because I love teaching or I love researching or whatever, being a student all my life. But at the same time I'm going to be responsible to society and be part of the activist service. Whatever my research is showing, I will make it public. Doesn't matter if it's copyrighted or whatever. I will make it copyleft. <laughs> okay, I think we have to do that. And those of us who have the privileges, in the sense that you and I are not struggling for our next meal. We're not struggling for having to move forward ahead. Okay, I shouldn't speak on your behalf, but I don't. And I think most people in this room don't. We are actually in some sense privileged, right? So if we have those privileges, let's get out of our comfort zones and say, this is what we will do. It might make me visible and famous or not, but it doesn't matter if it doesn't. So I'm doing what my conscience is telling me to do. Which means, if I'm doing a PhD, a sociology PhD, or anthropology PhD, or whatever, or uh, research, then the people I'm working with in the village or in the town, wherever, the community I'm working with is as important a researcher as I am. Their knowledge is as important as mine is. Can we think of academics like this? Can we think of academics in, 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 in India now, fortunately, at least one university has picked up my challenge to say, can we invite completely illiterate in the conventional sense of the word, Adivasi, indigenous people from central India, who can talk about, who know everything about the forest that they're living in. Can we invite them to a biology class as a professor? And let students experience the fact that here's a non-PhD, a non, he's not even at school, forget PhD, but is able to tell us the sorts of things that my professor is not able to tell me. And so through that actually gain uh, help in re regaining the, uh, the respect of different knowledge systems by acknowledging that uh, in this manner. That's one way of doing it. There's many, many other possibilities of doing this. So I think the role of academics is an intensely political role in that sense. It's an intensely social role in that sense. We cannot be uh, living in society which is going through so much turmoil without in some sense being engaged in trying to deal with that turmoil. It doesn't work for us to be pure academics publishing papers. I'm sorry, that's my view. That's how we could uh, decolonize ourselves also in our, in our academics. South South, totally agree. I was mentioning North, not, not South only because I think North South, even with the best of intentions, often retains a colonial flavor. Uh, and South South, of course, doesn't because for it's obvious, but uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think for instance, Africa and Asia needs to work much more together. There's so much we can exchange in between each other, uh, like what you were asking about. I'd love to invite you to India and show you some of the examples where people are doing this. And I'm sure those Indians would love to come to your place and understand what you're doing. Uh, unfortunately, most of the funding for that still comes from Europe. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to figure out something else. Without falling into the trap of going to the BRICS bank, uh, which is all the south, but it's as colonial as anything else.
Steffi. Um, and I would like to hear your opinion about um, questions of the power of these communities, of the groups you just introduced to us. Um, how can they use their power, for example, to, do, to deal with um, phenomena like shrinking spaces or shrinking civil spaces, uh, shrinking um, democracy spaces? What can they actually do? How can they use their power? What kind of power they have? And what, yeah, what experience do you have or what do you know how they deal with questions of power? For example, dealing with their uh, dim governments or local governments or whoever has the power. Um, my name is Anna, I'm an um, academic and uh, doing a PhD and an activist. Thank you for this um, opening introduction which gives um, help to overcome the feeling of powerlessness, which is super important and I would like to ask you if you could add one dot on your slide of critical alliances and solidarity for the next time and the dot would be the reappropriating the control over the means of production. Because you talked about food sovereignty and I'm doing um, research of intellectual property rights and the access to essential medicines worldwide and it's super important that we, only, uh, that we get food sovereignty, health sovereignty, transportation, collective mobility sovereignty, energy sovereignty and much more. somebody or it's uh, uh, 
the infringement of democratic rights by the police, show examples, now, try and dig out the information. We have fought for and we have the Right to Information Act in India, use the Right to Information or Freedom of Information Acts in any country of the world, or fight to have an act like that in the first place, a law like that. Um, third, always express solidarity. Even if it's a simple task of signing an online petition, and I know that clicktivism has become a derogatory word because if you are only clicking as an activist, then of course you're not really doing very much. But sometimes that's the only thing that is possible. Right now in the Narmada Valley, the, what Karan spoke about, there is flooding going on, 170 villages that have not been rehabilitated are being flooded. The least we can do, everybody in this room, is maybe sign on to a petition saying we protest this. Somewhere or the other, it could make a difference. Right? But if there are other ways of expressing solidarity, going to the area, sitting with the people, standing there in opposition to the threats, that's even better. So there's a number of these sorts of things. I mean, I'm just giving you two examples. There's so many different examples by which uh, the power that we have, the inherent power that we have, that the state has not given us, but it is inherent in us, can be expressed. Um, and and that, that you can do that whether you're an academic or an activist or a student or a child or whatever you are, a house husband or a housewife or whatever we are, we should be able to express ourselves through these means. Um, Anna, um, the reappropriation of the means of absolutely. Uh, that's why worker led production is something I talked about, group sovereignty. But you're right, I should be making a stronger point on that. Yes, absolutely. Economic democracy very much hinges on on the uh, collective producers' control over the means of production. Yes. Besime, uh, I don't know what I can tell you about the freedom of women that you cannot tell me. Uh, it should be the other way around because you have lived that you lived that freedom of women in an intensely conflicted zone. Um, Maybe one thing I can respond is to say that we need not just freedom of women, but also freedom of men from masculinity and patriarchy. Ariel, I don't know if you agree. I think you would. You, yeah, you can see you're nodding vigorously with that. Because we are also we are also trapped. No, uh, as my my upbringing, I was lucky that I had parents who were probably not so patriarchal. But I was in a society which was, which is intensely patriarchal, and so I'm also growing up with some of these. There's so much. Subconscious imbibing that takes place. How do we free ourselves from uh, from that kind of feelings of domination and so on? So I think it's uh, freedom of women and men and other sexualities, all of which have to go hand in hand. So that would be my response. Specifically on freedoms of women, you can tell me much more than I know.
we are interested in decolonizing development studies and finding alternatives to development. And why don't we then just team up and uh, let's organize these conferences together. So um, the first one was then already last year in May here. The second one is now at Kassel. And we do not yet know where the third one would be. So if you have offers, <laughs> or if you're interested in organizing a wonderful conference, then um, yeah, we'd be happy to learn about it. Yeah, actually it came about because um, we realized when we were doing a conference on post-development here in Kassel uh, one and a half years ago, that at almost the same time a topic with, um, a conference with almost the same topic was happening, happening in Sussex, which we hadn't heard about, and then we thought, yeah, let's combine, let's team up, let's organize, let's do it together. So um, you're invited if you're interested. Now we're having a break, we deserve it, and um, I would just like to briefly check with my fellow organizers um, if we now are 15 minutes behind schedule. It's okay if you can just have um, a panel start, which will also be 15 minutes later, right? Or any clear reason against that. Okay then. Okay then the panel will start 15 minutes later. Thanks.